everybody, and welcome to NBA TV's Basketballography. I'm Andre Aldridge. Over the years, a select group of New York natives have gotten the chance to star for their hometown Knicks. The list includes players like Stephon Marbury, Bernard King, and the subject of today's show, Richie Guerin. He learned his game on the playgrounds of the Bronx and went on to excel on the hardwood at Madison Square Garden. Richie was a fixture on the New York teams of the late 1950s and early 60s, becoming the first Nick to score 50 points in a single game. His career would also take him to St. Louis and Atlanta as a player and coach with the Hawks. But his journey began in the Big Apple, where Richie closely followed the great Nick teams of the early 50s. He idolized the stars of that era and hoped to follow in their footsteps. My real dreams were to play professional basketball. Being in New York, uh, there was fellows like Dick McGuire, Ernie Vandeweghe, and Bud Palmer that were playing basically with the Knicks at that time. The City College basketball teams that were so great in that era. It wasn't that I wanted to be like somebody, I just basically wanted to maybe get to that level of, of performance and, and with a lot of hard work it, it finally ended up for me. As a youngster in New York, Richie Guerin gravitated toward the city game. He honed his basketball skills during long hours on the playgrounds. Like most young fellows growing up in, in the Bronx, New York City, uh, that, that was basically the uh, neighborhood sport. It was easy enough to play. There was always a basket someplace to be found. I played all the team sports like most kids did growing up and uh, until I got to uh, college. Then I basically isolated my sports at basketball. The next step came at Iona. College basketball, Iona College versus high-scoring Marshall of Huntington, West Virginia. A feed to Richie Guerin, who twists through and under to score. During his college career, Guerin blossomed into one of the best players in the country, refining his game under the guidance of Iona's head coach, Jim McDermott. Jimmy McDermott was very helpful in developing my basketball skills. At that time, I played a lot of inside basketball, like center and forward for Iona and some guard uh, play, but um, we really worked a lot of extra hours at developing my outside game, trying to get me ready for the pros, and uh, I, owe, I owe an awful lot to Jimmy. But before he could think about the NBA, Richie had a more immediate priority. He was off to serve his country, joining the Marine Corps. You had to go into service. You had to either spend six months to two years. And so most of us had to go in, whether you wanted to or not. I happened to want to go. Even in the service, Richie had the chance to stay sharp in basketball as a member of the Marines team. But it was a lot of great competition. We used to play probably 55 to 60 games a year. So... And we played some of the colleges, Maurice Stokes, we played St. Francis when, when Stokes was there. So that even helped me more develop my basketball skills. After his stint with the Marines, Guerin joined his beloved Knicks, who selected him in the 1956 draft. And though he was a rookie, he was confident he could contribute right away. I fitted in well because I guess I was a young cocky kid from the Bronx and I felt that I had enough experience being in the Marine Corps and of course they had a veteran team at the time with Dick McGuire and Carl Braun and, and you know where was I going to fit in and where was I going to play but as luck would have it I made the team and then after about 10 or 20 games I became a starter. Dick McGuire was my first roommate and he made me feel very comfortable. He encouraged me to just be myself. Don't try to emulate him with, you know, passing and don't emulate Carl with his type of set shot or don't, you know, just do your, play to your strengths and, and see what happens. But one aspect of NBA life that took some getting used to was the long train rides to cities around the league. Well, in those days, when there was eight franchises, I mean, you left a lot of times after games by the, on a train. You had to do that. I mean, that's that's Rochester's and Syracuse's and Minneapolis's and places, Fort Wayne's. You didn't have the biggest airport type of things to do, and you, and you took a lot of trains. And you can imagine the size of fellas sleeping in these bunks on trains. But we used to get the conductor to take the walls down between uh, compartments and 
play cards almost all night long just passing time. And in the NBA of the 50s, the playing facilities weren't exactly luxurious. In my era, there weren't a lot of the great arenas that they have today. You know, there were all the old arenas that had been around for a while. They were nothing to look forward to, you know, going into. They were all war memorials. Syracuse War Memorial, you know, Philadelphia had Convention Hall. You know, like really bonds, old bonds, different places. But for this New York City native, one arena always had a magical aura. From the heart of New York City, from the sports capital of the world, this is Marty Glickman with Stan Lomax bringing you Madison Square Garden. Well, I was fortunate enough to play every year in the Garden as collegiate. I own a college, used to play one game a year in Madison Square Garden, so it was a, it was a thrill. There was a lot of nostalgia about the Garden. This is the Mecca, this is where it's happening, this is where it's all about. The opponents, even when you come in from out of town, you, you, you know, you look forward to playing in the Garden. Everything was exciting, and that never went away. Joining the Knicks in 1956, Richie Guerin brought instant offense, and one of the things that made him so effective was his style of ball handling. I used to shoot it from above my head, and a lot of people would shoot the set from their chest. Once I lifted the ball up, I could pass it from there to somebody if I saw them free, or I could drive the ball to the basket. Richie Guerin driving, beautiful play. You had to develop both shots, and it just didn't come easy to me. I had to work very hard to develop it. On occasion, even the amazing Celtics make mistakes. When this happens, Richie Guerin takes advantage of the situation and scores for the Knicks. I was a tough kid. I didn't get pushed around. You know, maybe I'd do more pushing than receiving. And I guess that worked to my advantage. I did a lot of penetrating, which put me in position to rebound the ball maybe more than some other guys. Rebounding is a lot to do with anticipation. Knowledge of your opponent, knowledge of the, your, your own teammates. Uh, there's a lot of physical parts of it as well. The brute strength, there's no substitute for that. But if you combine other things with that, you'll be that much more effective. Garen quickly established himself as an elite player. Named an All-Star in just his second season, he went on to play in six consecutive All-Star games. Cousy driving. A very good feed to Richie Garen, who dumped it in. But he couldn't lift the Knicks out of their state of mediocrity. The team struggled during his years in New York, despite Richie's individual brilliance. A good lead pass into Richie Garen gives the Knickerbockers a two-point play, but they trail 108 to 90. My seven years with the Knicks, we made the playoffs once. We really had weak teams, to be very honest with you. Every year you get excited about your, your possibilities, and by Christmas time, you're almost making plans for vacation. The New York Knickerbockers come out on the short end of a long night as the Boston Celtics take a 116-96 decision and breeze along in first place in the Eastern Division. In March of 1962, the Knicks faced Wilt Chamberlain and the Sixers. The game Garen would long remember, but the memories weren't pleasant. Wilt had a great first half. We were losing by 13 or 14 points. You know, you go in in the locker room, you're talking about what you're going to try to do. To, you know, like even though we were out of it, you always tried to win every game. To me, it was very, very noticeable as the second half started that their attitude had been... Let's see if we can get Wilt 100 points tonight. But Wilt, he, he, I think he made 28 out of 32 foul shots, you know, which is so unusual for Wilt, and scored 100 points. After seven years with the Knicks, Richie Guerin got the jolting news early in the 1964 season that he'd been traded to St. Louis. And the number one draft pick that year was Art Heyman. So I guess they, they felt I was like 30 years of age, and I guess they felt that they could rebuild whatever they had to do, you know, with starting with Art Heyman. I felt that I gave them seven years of just really blood and guts every night, even though the team was not, not very competitive. And I used to play 40, 45 minutes a game. Anybody that tells you your feelings are not hurt is, is wrong. You, you know, you, you, your feelings are hurt. 
Richie Guerin was obtained by the Hawks this year from the New York Knicks. He's 6'4", and a fine guard. Plays a good game offensively and defensively. The final exponent of the sensational two-hand set, Guerin. But his early days with the Hawks were frustrating as he struggled to fit his talents into a new system. It was a very big adjustment for me. In fact, I almost came home. I went out for dinner with Bobby Pettit, and Bobby said to me, Rich, just play. You know, just play the way you play. So I did that, and I felt more comfortable. I didn't have to score as much as, you know, when I was with New York, because we had great players. And then it became very enjoyable. Richie began to mesh with his new backcourt partner, Lenny Wilkins, one of the league's best point guards. Well, Lenny was the ultimate professional. Very good ball handler, good defensive player. And I think once I loosened up my game, I think Lenny saw this and he loosened up his game a little bit, which made it more effective as a team, more effective as a guard combination. Garen also teamed up with another future Hall of Famer, forward Bob Pettit. Bobby took care of himself, took an awful lot of pride in his game. Probably couldn't jump more than six inches off the floor, but probably might have been one of the greatest rebounders of his, his era. Great leader. He was, just, he was as good a teammate as you could have. He had a chance to win every night, you know, and that was, that was great. And we never won at all, but, you know, we, we were there a lot. After reaching the Western Finals in 64, the Hawks started slowly the next season, and Garrett, while sidelined, received a new role. I got a call to come out to see Mr. Kerner, the owner. And he said, uh, I'm making a coaching change. I'd like you to take the team over. I said, uh, I'm still playing. He said, yeah, but I think when you come back from your injury, you can do both. I said, I don't know about that. He said, well, I talked to Bob Pettit already. You know, he used to confide a lot in Bobby, and rightly so. And Bobby thinks you can, and he thinks you should do it. So I said, I'll try it, and if it doesn't work, I'll just go back to play next year. Anyway, it worked. But there wasn't enough money in the budget to get an assistant coach. <laughs> so I used to appoint one of the more veteran players to watch things because I was still playing 40 minutes a game. He may have still been a player, but Richie wasn't shy about exerting his authority with a firm style of leadership. My personality never changed. If I got on somebody, I got on them. Sometimes I got on them as a player, you know what I mean? Because you're out there and, and as a leader, you're supposed to do things like that. Whatever I had to say at that time, it was, it was in the locker room. It wasn't in, for the papers. It, it stayed in the locker room. It had its advantages offensively, some di disadvantages defensively. From a defensive standpoint, being a guard, you couldn't see what was going on behind you, so if something was a breakdown, you know, you turn around and say, what happened? Offensively, it was very easy, because being a guard, you can do things out there that you, your coach doesn't have to call a timeout and say, okay, this is what we want to run. And I can do that being out there, and, you know, run a play for somebody. It was a great experience, but it took us toll, because you, you lose a tough game, and you go back to the hotel, you go back to the bar and have a beer or something, and there's really like nobody to talk to. And if there would have been an assistant or something along those lines, it would have been great. So it was tough, but I enjoyed it. After retiring as a player, Garen became the Hawks' full-time head coach, and he instilled an aggressive defensive approach. The full court press was the pet defensive weapon of the Atlanta Hawks. They pressed the pass in, and they pressed the ball when it was passed in, often with the same result. We used to pride ourselves in team defense. We were one of the best defensive teams in the league, and we were a disciplined team. Garen was named the NBA's Coach of the Year in 1968 and guided the Hawks to over 300 victories with his team-oriented philosophy. We had X amount of plays for guards, X amount of plays for centers, X amount of plays for forwards. Not that, that we would use them all in the course of a game, but that we had enough options. You can't totally, as a coach, leave it up to the players on the court to recognize, geez, maybe Lou hasn't gotten a shot the last couple of three minutes. You want to make sure they're kept in the flow of things. 
lot of your shooters can get their own shot, you know, when they get the ball. A lot can't. So that's the value of recognition by a coach or assistant coach or a teammate out in the court. By 1970, the Hawks had moved from St. Louis to Atlanta and drafted an exciting new star, Pistol Pete Maravich. Head coach Richie Guerin was amazed at the skills of this flamboyant rookie. I've never seen anybody as good as he was with the ball. He would come to my basketball camp for a couple of days every summer. I used to just stare at him. I couldn't believe things he was doing. He had so much God-given talent. He could shoot the ball as well as anybody, but he would take such low percentage shots. Instead of taking the 20 footers, he'd take 30 footers. He could get to 20 feet anytime he wanted to. He could drive to the basket anytime he wanted to. Then he ain't take a crazy hook. He just always had to create the sensational part of the game because he always was thinking that's what fans wanted. While Maravich did put on a dazzling show, the challenge for Garen was getting him to blend his talents into a team concept. I drafted this kid. What's going through his mind? What can I say? You can't do this, you can't do that, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. And that was my biggest test as a coach, when I was truly tested by my players. Because they saw me allow somebody to do things that I never allowed any, any of them to do. Only because I was thinking about myself, that what I went through when I got traded to St. Louis, where somebody took away from me all my individual stuff. Richie tried to add substance to Pete's style and make him more of a well-rounded player, but it was a tough adjustment. But I knew he was going to have some growing pains only because you have, to, you, you have to conform him into your team. I knew it wasn't going to be an easy job, only because when you, when you draft a kid that's really been nothing but a, a one-on-one type of player his whole life with unlimited harnesses on him, to change dramatically wasn't going to happen right away. Richie is a very determined young fellow. I played with him for 10 years when he was with the Knicks and the Hawks. And he, uh, in visiting with him before the game, is very pleased with the progress of Pete Maravich. He says Pete now is ahead of schedule and doing the things that uh, he wants him to do. And he feels that, uh, as everyone, that he's going to be a great pro. It took him a, a good full season, you know, to harness his talent a little bit more. The Hawks had the chance to add another electrifying talent when Julius Irvin tried to jump from the ABA to the NBA in 1972. Irwin Wiener, who was an agent, represented Walt Frazier as well, and Julius Irvin, contacts us and said, uh, Julius wants to come into the NBA. He's going to be a free agent at the end of that year. And would we be interested in talking? I said, absolutely, you have to talk. Everything that's worked out, we signed the deal. He says, you got to do us one favor. Don't announce this until after the playoffs are over. I said, we can't do that. We got we to gotta get on board right away with the league office. But the deal fell through when Irvin's ABA team, the Virginia Squires, went to court to keep him. And the Hawks were left to wonder what might have been. If we'd have announced it before our draft and said, look, take our number one if that's what you want. In other words, we'll use that to draft this you know, player. We've already signed him. He's a free agent. We don't want to go to courts for all this stuff because who knows? I guarantee you it would have been fine. And we would have had Pete and Julius. We would have had ourselves quite an exciting franchise. Richie Guerin accumulated many memories in his NBA career. One of them was the night he lit up Larry Costello and the Syracuse Nationals. Larry, I scored my pro high against 57 points. And he was probably the toughest player that guarded me. He was strong, he was very powerful, he was quick as could be, and he played as close as anybody to me defensively, and it was really surprising and very rewarding that I was able to have the type of night I had against him, 
But for Richie, no opponent was ever tougher than the big O, Oscar Robertson. Oscar was 6'5", 6'6". He was a great rebounder for a guy. He could post anybody up. I mean, anybody. Because he had that fall-away jump shot. He really was a great passer for a man his size. He had great hands. He was the perfect specimen of a basketball player. I mean, it wasn't one floor in his game. Not one. I think he was the most complete all-around player I've ever played against or witnessed, even till today. Looking back on his 13 seasons as a player, Richie Guerin draws satisfaction from knowing that he always made it tough on his opponents. And maybe if somebody's playing against me, they're saying, man, you know, you're going to be tired when you get finished playing against them tonight. I was aggressive out there and, and sort of tough and, and with ability. I think those are the type of things that you feel very proud about. And Richie's career certainly gave him plenty to be proud of. In 1962, he averaged 30 points a game and set a team scoring record that lasted nearly 30 years until it was broken by Patrick Ewing. Garen was also a great passer, setting a team mark with 21 assists in one game. About the only thing he didn't have was good timing. He came to the Knicks just after their great teams of the early 50s and left just as they were starting to build the nucleus of their championship teams. Nevertheless, Garen kept bringing excitement to the Garden during the Knicks' lean years and gave the fans a true hometown hero. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on NBA TV Basketballography.